I saw this listing for three free iMacs on Facebook Marketplace. I got the address and went for a look. Left by the side of the road in an industrial estate was three of Apple's most unique iMac model, the iMac G4. Released in 2002 and now 22 years old, they are still regarded as one of Apple's best designed products. These three are covered in mud, one is missing a bottom cover, and the larger one's display bezel has been ripped off. Despite their condition, I have a plan for the larger one. I don't know where these computers have been for the last 22 years, but it seems they've spent some time outside, or at least in a really dirty shed. I've always wanted to put modern internals into one of these iMacs to make it usable in the modern age, but I've never wanted to gut a working one in good condition. So when I saw these, I thought I'd be actually saving them by gutting the non-working original internals and building them into new computers. So that's exactly what we're going to do. But the grime and missing bezel isn't the only issue with this iMac. The screen is on a major lean and the supporting arm is splitting apart. There's no better place to start than the display. I'll be removing the original 1440x900 LCD for a higher resolution panel. My two options were to retrofit a USB-C portable display or to use a MacBook Pro screen. I opted to go for the 1920x1200 display from a MacBook Pro as I couldn't find any other display that was the exact same dimensions. Unfortunately, the original display uses a totally different connector to that of our replacement, so we'll have to run a new cable up the arm. The MacBook screen will also need a controller to power it. I purchased this one from AliExpress. Connecting the new controller to the MacBook screen, we can test that everything is working before we fit it inside the iMac. The process of running the required cables for the new screen is a task that requires complete disassembly of the computer. With the display panel removed, we can measure the diameter of the neck hole. We have a maximum width of under 11mm. For comparison, a USB-C connector is too large to fit, so my idea of using a USB-C portable monitor wouldn't have worked anyway. I have heard of some people re-pinning the original wiring to adapt it to a new display, but I was daring enough to open up the arm for a total rewire. Of course, it was secured with these weird Apple proprietary screws that not even my toolkit had, but a pair of side cutters worked pretty well too. Taking the two halves apart, we can see this was indeed the correct path to take, because it has revealed the root cause of the crooked display, loose screws. One has even fallen out. Removing the top articulating section, we can see how the wiring has been run. To free the remainder of the arm mechanism, I'll need to access the internals of the computer. Opening the base reveals the true condition of the iMac. It does look better than the outside, but it's not without damage. There's a bit of rust, plenty of grime, a bent pin on the main interconnect cable, and what looks like a screen cable that wasn't even plugged in. Someone has definitely opened this up. If it was working when it was opened, it sure wasn't after they'd had a look inside. Continuing the disassembly, we can find the longest screws known to man holding in the smallest of components. I'll need to remove the DVD and hard drive to access the upper section of the computer. Under this really disgustingly dirty fan is the cables and screws holding the display's arm in place. I can now start unfeeding the original wiring. The lower section of the arm is a bit of a different setup. The spring attaches to this section with a rod, which needs to be removed to allow us to remove the surrounding bracket, which will in turn give us enough room to run our new wiring. Once I remove the bracket and inner piece, 
I found the missing screw from the other end and this weird piece of rod that I have no idea where it originally went. I'll be reusing the power LED and microphone cables, however the remaining will be discarded. I had to cut them out as the hole at the base was only about 9mm and it was impossible to remove all the original cables intact. It was then the process of routing the new display cable through first. It was a tight fit at the top section and that was the bigger piece. The lower section was so small I genuinely thought the wires were going to snap before I got the connector through. It did make it all the way through, although a few wires had sustained some damage to the insulation, which I had to fix. Once the largest cable was in, it was time to repeat the process for the other wires. I had to remove the connector from the backlight cable in order to feed it through, reconnecting it once in place. Now it's just a case of putting the arm back together, and that's no easy feat. In fact, proving to be not only the most difficult part of this build, but one of the most complicated things I've ever had to reassemble. Running the new wires was the easy part. The issues come when trying to attach the top articulating arm, although overcome by first placing the wires into the circular part before pressing it into place. The bigger issue was getting the two halves to close. There was a spring inside, but it didn't appear as though it was the reason everything was out of alignment. I had to use zip ties to stop it from springing apart, and it took breaking my screwdriver to get the two pieces attached, but the battle wasn't over, as there's still a massive gap between them, and tightening the screws didn't pull them together. There's alignment tabs that are, well, not aligning. The whole piece is skew with. I tried for hours, but in the end, this stalled the project for a number of weeks. Eventually, I got some help from my father. We clamped it in a vise and gave it some good hits with a mallet to finally get it to close. Testing my new cable setup, I can see an image on the display, but there's no backlight. I must have damaged a wire assembling the arm. All this work. For nothing. But even with the original backlight cable, I was still not getting any backlight. At a closer inspection, I noticed the pinout was different each end. A wonderful bit of electrical engineering. Turning the cable around, you are swapping the positive and negative. So I just needed to swap the wires around for the backlight cable and retest. Thankfully, nothing was damaged as a result of the reverse polarity, and the display now works. Before we reassemble the computer, we should give it a clean. But it was clear soapy water alone wasn't going to remove the staining to the plastic. So it was time to bust out the toothpaste for that ultra white shine. Plus it'll give our Mac a new minty smell. It sounds crazy, but it's amazing how well toothpaste whitened the plastic. I'll need to repeat this for every piece of this iMac. Helping restore the outer case into as best a condition as we can get it. Let's work on getting the new display in place of the old one. The new screen has a much smaller footprint, despite being the exact same screen size, so it can't attach directly to the frame. I'll instead align it with the front bezel, making sure the screen is centered before applying some temporary masking tape to hold it in place while we attach it from the other side. There wasn't many options on mounting the screen. I couldn't screw it into the bezel as the screws would be visible from the other side so adhering it down was the best option. The new screen circuit board is located at the very bottom and interferes with the frame. I can't cut it off, so I'll have to cut the frame to accommodate it. Now the frame can be reattached to the bezel. Originally this was done with plastic clips, however all but two have been broken. Someone has already tried to use super glue to reattach it at some point, but failed miserably. I'm going to use the same adhesive I use to attach phone and tablet screens. It cures over a few hours, allowing time to get everything aligned before it sets. I'll let it dry with some weight applied to ensure a strong bond to the bezel. While that's drying, I'll get the arm reattached to the base. 
then the display's housing can be reinstalled by first feeding the new cabling through. Now it's just the case of connecting and fastening the display cable and backlight control board to the back of the screen before it's attached onto the iMac. Once everything is confirmed working, I can remove the tape from the front and slide the screen into place. But what's a fancy new screen without any new hardware to go with it? I've purchased an M1 Mac Mini which I'm going to adapt to fit inside this iMac G4. You could also fit the M2 model, however I got a good deal on this one. We'll need to completely disassemble it as we'll be utilising most of the original internals. Once we get past the torque security screws, the Mac Mini is super simple to get apart. There's a lot of empty space inside since Apple removed the hard drive and RAM upgradability. With the fan out of the way, there is just two more cables and two screws before the logic board can slide free from the case. The power supply is attached by one retaining clip and three screws. Once unfastened, it too slides out the back of the housing. To shrink the Mini further, I'll remove the decorative plastic back by first unplugging the power button cable and undoing a few more screws before disconnecting two antenna cables attaching to it. This is the bare Mac Mini logic board. It's very small which makes it ideal for retrofitting into an old iMac. To mount it inside the iMac, I'll be using this 3D printed bracket I found online. It came designed to accommodate the two logic board screws, but not those for the fan. So I simply drilled some holes and glued the original threaded posts into the 3D printed base. As for the Mini's power supply, we need to do some minor modifications to it to make it work. Firstly, I'm going to cut off the cable organiser to allow the wires to bend more freely and then chop off the power plug. The original power connector is too large to fit. Instead, I'll solder on the original connector from the old power supply to make it attach directly to the original iMac's power socket. The Mini's main power wires are incredibly short. So not only will my wire strippers not reach, so I'll need to use pliers, but there isn't any room for error if I mess up. With the wires stripped, I can apply some heat shrink and get them soldered together. Now the power supply can fit neatly on the underside of the Mac Mini adapter. I'll get this adapter attached to the base using the old power supply screws before finding an appropriate screw to fasten the power supply in place. Then I can find two more to mount the Mac Mini's logic board. Moving over to the plastic backing piece we removed earlier, I can salvage the power button from it. The button itself is plastic welded on, but that's nothing a hot soldering iron can't fix. I'll get the cable plugged back into the logic board so I can get to creating a custom bracket to allow it to work with the original iMac power button. For this, I just used an old galvanized pipe bracket I had in the shed. Once it's positioned and glued into place, you can see how it works. Proceeding, I can give the fan a good clean out before we get it back in for a test boot. To connect the logic board to the display controller, I'll use this custom flexible HDMI cable. The individual pieces can be brought separately on AliExpress. This can allow you to make cables of any length with whatever angle connector you like. And being low profile, it's perfect for a build like this one. I'll get the display controller attached to the top of the logic board with some adhesive. While it looks like I just stuck it directly onto the heatsink, this is actually sitting on the airflow duct, so it shouldn't get very hot. Now all that's left to do is get the display cable attached to the control board with a 12 volt power source, which for the moment is coming from a power adapter. 
I can now press the power button. But the fan didn't spin up, I heard no chime, and nothing is showing on screen. I realized I didn't attach the speaker, as it did in fact boot up. Do you know what's easy to test? Your phone with my application iTest. Available for both iOS and Android, iTest provides the ability to test hardware functions of a phone or tablet, with both a semi-automatic mode or manual mode, allowing you to easily test functions that would otherwise be too complicated without the aid of such an application. These include things like the compass, gyroscope, proximity and light sensors, or even screen burn-in. At the end of testing, you can get a nice little overview of your results and easily share them if needed. With a successful power on test, it's time we get the display powered from the Mac Mini. For this, I'll probe the power connector on the Mac Mini to find a suitable 12 volt power source. Then it's just the case of cutting down a cable to size and getting it soldered onto the connector. With the display controller now plugged into the main power supply, I can reattach the fan. To be able to plug anything into the computer, we need to add extension cables that run from the logic board to the back of the case. I had ordered some thin cables similar to the HDMI cable for this purpose, however they didn't show up in time for the video. So you'll have to excuse these massively oversized cables. However, what this does demonstrate is just how valuable that extra space under the logic board is. The excess cable can be tucked away underneath, out of sight. I'll cut the plastic end off this USB extension cable to allow it to snugly fit into the original USB port, making it appear totally original. As these are not the low profile cables I ordered for this project, I'll also have to cut off the cable strain relief to allow the computer to close. Preceding the ports, I can reattach the speaker and antennas for both Bluetooth and Wi-Fi. The Wi-Fi antenna proved to be not so easy to remove. I thought it was screwed into place, however, it turns out it was riveted. When I pried it apart, it tore the cable right off. But fear not, the iMac has one built-in antenna, however the plug differs from what's on the Mac Mini. I can, however, cut the old connector off and solder on the cable from the Mac Mini Wi-Fi antenna. Once it's attached, this completes the Mac Mini conversion. I can't believe how well the Mac Mini fits inside the G4. Some things piece together so well you think it was designed to fit. Once the proper cables I have ordered arrive, I'll get them installed. There is also the cables for the status light and microphone which I've left in the iMac's arm but have not yet attached to the Mac Mini. For now, those have just been taped aside. Finally, after many months, or what's been only 17 minutes for you, we can finally close up the two halves. And we're done. So this is it. An outdated, broken, dirty iMac I picked up off the side of the road has been transformed into a modern Apple Silicon Mac without compromising the original design. This has been the most difficult project I've completed, and because of the issues I faced with closing the arm, I honestly thought this conversion wasn't going to work. In the end, I couldn't be more happy with the result. It has all the performance and features of an M1 Mac Mini in the look of a 22-year-old iMac. Bluetooth and Wi-Fi are also working perfectly in the iMac's enclosure. As for time, the conversion took over 9 hours. That's at least how much footage I had. As for the other two iMacs, I have yet to do anything with them, but I will revisit them at some point, whether in a video on YouTube or as a special for my Patreon subscribers. And on that note, this has been a Hugh Jeffries video. If you like what you saw, consider subscribing and check out the custom tech playlist for more videos just like this one. And if you're looking for any used devices, be sure to check out my online store, link for which is down in the description. That's all for this video, and I'll catch you guys next time.